The Millennium, A Prophetic Forecast by Johanna Brandt Chapter 8 The Fourth Period The Sword The Crusades Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. Matthew 10 verse 34 A full 600 years have gone by. The names of Constantine the Great and his mother, Helena, have become household names of historical significance. And in the Roman Empire, the subtle influence of their lives and achievements is still to be felt. The worldly prosperity of the Christian Church still grows greater and greater. And in the heart of the heathen races, the teachings of the Christian faith has firmly taken root. In the West, the fall of heathendom is an established fact, but now we find the ceremonies of pagan worship in a subtle form in the Church. We find superstition and spiritual ignorance, where formerly the grace of knowledge abounded. We find the images of saints and martyrs enshrined in the homes and hearts of the Christian people, where Christ had reigned as Sovereign Lord. The worship of sacred relics now forms an important part of the religious life, and all eyes are longingly turned to the greatest relic of all, Palestine, the Holy Land. Since Helena's day, millions of Christians have visited the East and millions of lives been lost on those difficult and dangerous expeditions. For the Turks, who are in possession of the Holy Land, look with growing suspicion and unrest on those countless pilgrimages and torture and massacre the unprotected travellers with unsparing ferocity, but in vain. The perils of the undertaking only seem to augment the religious fervour by which these pilgrimages are impelled. The Crusades, the so-called Holy Wars, were Christian expeditions for the recovery of the Holy Land after it had fallen into the hands of the Turks and form a part of the thousand years conflict between Christianity and the Islam religion. They lasted nearly 200 years, 1096 to 1270, cost nearly 7 million Christian lives, and failed in their object after all. We find ourselves here face to face again with one of those extraordinary complexities and one of the very worst type in history of religious zeal, which drives men to butcher their fellow creatures. The war cry of the Crusades was, God wills it, God wills it, and was uttered by men, ay, and women, and children too, who honestly believed in its truth. Furthermore, the Crusades were assisted in their endeavours by divine revelations, as we shall see in this brief sketch of the First Crusades, which makes one think that the holy wars were more holy than they at first sight appear, that they were a divinely ordained and indispensable part of the reign of blood and violence, which was ushered in by the gentle Christ himself on Calvary's cross. Our brain refuses to grasp these things, but we must try to look at them from every point of view and keep the open mind, remembering that God's ways are not our ways. A little human blood, more or less, what does it matter in the attainment of an ideal? And then it would have been so good for the Turks to have been converted to the Christian faith, even at the point of the sword. In common justice to the Christians, however, 
we must emphasize the fact that it was the Turks who began the shedding of blood by murdering the inoffensive Christians on their religious excursions. When in 1065, only 2,000 returned of an expedition of over 7,000 persons, there had been no provocation whatever on the side of the pilgrims, beyond the fact that they had entered foreign domain, uninvited, on a peaceful mission. They only wanted to be left alone, to worship at the holy places, and to return to their own land with a few splinters or nails from the cross, or the bones of martyred saints, or perhaps some water from the River Jordan, or a handful of soil from Golgotha. Small things these be, the cause of such mighty upheavals in East and West. On the way to Palestine, houses of refuge had been built, hospitals and monasteries for the comfort and safety of the Christian travellers. But these proved altogether inadequate as the pilgrimages continued to increase in numbers. Even the armed escorts were overwhelmed by the foe, and things had assumed a serious aspect when the extraordinary figure of a man arose as the divinely sent avenger and saviour of the persecuted Christians. Peter of Amiens, a sufferer in one of the pilgrimages, was a French military officer who had left the army to follow a life of extreme asceticism as a hermit in a cave. There he seems to have developed his inborn mystic faculties to an abnormal degree, until he too decided to pay a visit to the Holy Land. He joined an expedition, of which he was one of the only members to escape, after having witnessed the appalling fate of his comrades at the hands of the Turks. Through countless dangers, he succeeded in reaching Jerusalem, and here it was that he had a vision in which the Christ appeared to him, commanding him to return to the West and make a public appeal to church and state to send speedy help to the tortured Christians. The hermit seems to have lost no time in fulfilling his mission. Armed with a letter of authority from Simon, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, to the Pope, Urban II, he returned to Italy at the head of a tumultuous host. Half naked and bearing the crucifix, he addressed the people by the way as far as he went, with an impassioned eloquence that had a most extraordinary effect. Even the Pope was fired by his zeal and impressed by the story of his vision to such an extent that he organized vast public gatherings under the open sky, at which he and the hermit wrought upon the multitudes, working them up to a pitch of frenzied enthusiasm by their vivid word pictures of Christian martyrdom in Palestine. Pope Urban organized the First Crusade with such care and caution, and on such a vast scale, that a full year elapsed before his preparations were complete. In the meantime, Peter of Amiens had no patience to wait for his army, but decided to go on ahead with an irregular troop of 50,000 men. He traveled through southern France, calling upon the people to join his rescuing band, with the result that it swelled to 80,000. Some historians say 100,000 men and women, of whom only 7,000 reached Constantinople. The others had all been massacred by the Bulgarians. Nothing daunted, the remaining 7,000 pursued their way through Asia Minor and came to a pitiful end beyond the Bosphorus. With the exception of a small number, of whom Peter of Amiens who seems to have borne a charmed life, was one. Meanwhile, 
The voice of Pope Urban II sounded through the length and breadth of the land in an impassioned appeal to the people, and the fact that countless thousands responded to his call testifies to the power of the Church even at that time. Under the leadership of the Duke of Nether-Lorraine, Godfrey of Bouillon, a brave and devout knight, 60,000 men met at the agreed starting point, Constantinople, in 1096. He had been chosen as leader because of the depth and moderation of his character, the magnetic power of his personality, and the awe with which his gigantic figure inspired the people. His strength was superhuman, and he was as modest as he was brave. But there were others under him, as sub-leaders of the expedition, who were richer and mightier than he, princes and lords, nobles and knights, and bishops of incredible wealth and power. Men from every station in life joined the ranks of the First Crusade. Monks left their cells, laborers, peasants, students, all deserted their posts and wended their way to Constantinople. From where the expedition was to start on its way to the Holy Land, everywhere the crusade excited the frenzied enthusiasm of the people. And it grew in size until in 1097. In the early spring, its proportions had swelled to 600,000 men and even women, who were not to be debarred from taking part in this first great undertaking. The crusaders wore a red cross on the right shoulder in token of their mission, and their cry of, God wills it, God wills it, rose and swelled and was borne away on the winds to the remotest corner of the land. God wills it that we punish the heathen peoples with the sword. God wills it that we wreak the blood of our martyred brothers with the blood of their persecutors. God wills it that we convert pagans to the Christian faith, even at the point of the sword. God wills it that we storm the Holy Land and take possession of it by violence. God wills it. God wills it. The bitter, unconscious irony of this cry seems to have been felt as little in those days as the cry of blood, more blood, for love of God and international freedom is grasped in its full hideous significance at the present day. The first encounter with the Turks took place near the old city of Nasir, which was taken without much difficulty, after which the Sultan of Iconium was defeated at Dorylaeum. But then the difficulties began. The army was powerful enough to crush the enemy at any time, but nature placed almost insurmountable barriers across its path and proved a far more formidable enemy than the Turks. In the march across the barren stretch of country through Asia Minor, thousands of women and children and animals perished through drought and heat. Indescribable were these scenes of suffering and death in a strange land and the fast diminishing army of the brave Godfrey of Bouillon looked forward to the actual struggle, which was still to come, with apprehensive dread. The first Christian kingdom, which was established in the east, was at Odessa, where the Duke Baldwin, Godfrey of Bouillon's brother, defeated the enemy in an encounter which had for its object the deliverance of a Christian nobleman from an exceedingly dangerous position. Baldwin then rejoined the head army and took part in the siege of Antioch, which lasted over nine months and demanded heavy sacrifices from the crusaders, who, however, eventually took the city and scattered the Turks. Here, an all too brief period of rest was allowed the worn out crusaders, for the Turks returned unexpectedly 
with powerful reinforcements, and in their turn besieged the city, which was now occupied by Christians. Terrible indeed were the privations now endured in a strange city, which had, during the late nine months' siege, been wholly depleted of provisions, arms and all necessities of life. Famine, drought and pestilence reduced the numbers of the crusading army to such an extent that the remainder was on the point of surrender when, at that supremely critical moment, a miracle took place. One of the crusaders, a man named Bartholomew, rose from among the people and declared that the Christ had appeared to him in a vision, in which he gave the promise of victory if an attack were made on the enemy under the influence and power of a lance, which would be found in a certain church in the besieged city. The lance, so Bartholomew continued, was the same with which Christ's side had been pierced on the cross. Now the strange part of this story is that on taking up the stone floor on the spot indicated in the church in Antioch, the crusaders found a lance indeed, and that they were so much encouraged and strengthened by the possession of this most sacred relic that they were able to make a powerful and wholly unexpected attack on the besieging enemy. Not doubting for a moment that they had indeed found the holy lance, the crusaders rose at dawn, confessed their sins, partook of the holy sacrament, and surprised the enemy with such an overwhelming onslaught that his numbers were scattered like chaff before the wind. In the enemy's camp were found large stores of provisions and arms, and the exhausted crusaders were enabled to strengthen and equip themselves for the final struggle. The second Christian kingdom in the east, under the Norman sovereign, Bohemond of Tarant, was then established at Antioch, as Baldwin had founded one at Odessa. The road now lay open to Jerusalem. It was in June 1099, nearly three years after the departure from Constantinople, that the walls of the holy city rose at last before the longing eyes of the Crusaders. Jerusalem, with its temples and towers, its historical glories and sacred traditions. The pilgrims rejoiced loudly, while tears of relief and gratitude flowed from their eyes. And falling, they kissed the sacred soil, forgetting in their ecstasy all they had hitherto endured. The city, which lay on an elevation, was strongly fortified and guarded by Jews, Saracens and Turks. Here a deadly struggle began, a prolonged conflict, against which the worn-out pilgrims were powerless. Dissensions arose in their own ranks. Once relief came, unexpectedly, along the coast in the form of a friendly fleet, laden with food and war material and strong reinforcements. And then the third miracle of the expedition took place. The pilgrims saw, or thought they saw, an exalted rider on the Mount of Olives who urged them to storm the city. Here we meet the immortal Peter of Amiens again. Although how, or when and where he joined the Crusaders after the fateful termination of his own enterprise, we have been unable to find out. More frenzied and fanatic than ever, the hermit addressed the Crusaders in a storm of passionate eloquence, urging them to obey the vision on the Mount of Olives, and addressing himself particularly to the divided leaders of the expedition, imploring them to set aside their personal differences and to unite their powers in one last effort to enter the city. Impressed by the appearance of that strange vision and overruled in spite of themselves by the hermit's arguments, 
the sub-leaders extended the hand of reconciliation to one another, and the attack was commenced. An inconceivably fierce struggle, lasting two days, began, in which many exhausted Christians were content to press forward to kiss the sacred city walls before falling beneath the Saracen's sword. On the third day, several of the crusaders were able to scale the walls, and, entering the city in that way, they opened one of the porches on the inside, through which the pilgrims poured in. An indescribable scene of carnage then ensued. Wholesale butcheries in the streets in which neither age nor sex was spared. The blood of the vanquished flowed in rivers from the high steps of the temple, and no atrocity perpetrated on the infidels, the enemies of the cross, seemed great enough. Although the Duke of Bouillon did not contaminate himself like the rest, he was powerless to stem the sweeping tide of bloodthirstiness, which only subsided when there was not a single Muslim left to destroy. Then a change came over the Crusaders. They cleansed themselves of blood and wended their way, bareheaded and barefoot, in a long procession to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, or of the Resurrection. So closely do the works of light and darkness touch each other. The Crusaders decided to establish Palestine as a Christian kingdom with Godfrey of Bouillon at its head. He had proved himself a worthy leader and allowed his scruples to be overruled, although he refused, with his customary modesty, to wear a king's crown and contented himself with the title of higher honour, protector of the Holy Sepulchre. We must now leave the First Crusaders after having given this most meagre outline of their adventures and achievements and briefly trace the subsequent fortunes and misfortunes of the Holy Land. What had been taken by the sword was lost by the sword again and Odessa was the first to fall into the hands of the Turks, thus necessitating the formation of a second crusade in 1147. Of this expedition, which was headed by King Louis VII of France and Conrad III of Germany, and which surpassed the First Crusade in size and splendor, only a very small portion reached Jerusalem alive. Its failure was followed by a period of dissension among the Christian rulers, whose powers of resistance were fast ebbing away under the repeated Turkish attempts to recover Palestine. And when the fall of Jerusalem was made known in the West, the Third Crusade was organized by the grey-headed Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa, assisted by Richard Lionheart of England and Philip Augustus of France in 1189. This, too, failed miserably, despite its 150,000 men, Frederick being drowned in crossing a river, and Richard Lionheart being taken prisoner. Jerusalem was in the hands of the great Turkish Sultan, Saladin, who was as humane and generous as he was brave. He treated the Christians mercifully, although he destroyed all the sacred relics he could find, and had all the crosses pulled down, while he converted the Christian churches into temples for the worship of Allah. He, however, guaranteed to allow the pilgrims to visit the holy places unmolested. The coast towns were at that time still in the hands of the Christians, but they fell one by one despite repeated attempts to save them. There were four subsequent crusades, and even that monument of iniquity, a children's crusade in 1212, in which thousands of children lost their lives, was all in vain. Nearly seven million Christian lives were sacrificed within 200 years, and yet, in the end, Mohammedans 
remained in possession of the Holy Land. When in 1291, with the fall of Acre, the last trace of the Christian occupation of Syria disappeared. But although the Crusades failed their real object, they were followed by undeniable advantages for both East and West, and they constituted in themselves a complete phase of historical development. By far, the greatest changes were wrought in the Church itself, but as these led directly to the causes by which the Reformation was brought about, we shall treat this aspect under the fifth period in the following chapter, and now confine ourselves to a few remarks on the gradual upheavals and changes of a more general character which affected every land and nation in the remotest degree connected with the Crusades. The process of human evolution seems to be an incredibly slow and costly affair. For it is only now, after a period of nearly a thousand years, that men are beginning, consciously, to reap the benefits of those crusades, and to apply to their own lives the lessons learned by their forefathers. The Mohammedans were not converted to Christianity, it is true, but the old fanatic zeal of Islam waned unconsciously in the contact with Christian races. The same movement of revulsion from earthly interests which inspired the Crusaders in their self-sacrificing and heroic efforts to attain an ideal roused the Islam to the pursuit of high culture and worldly development, which was felt to be lacking when compared with the civilization introduced by the West. This was particularly felt in the 13th century, when for a period of nearly 10 years, the Christians remained in undisturbed possession of Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Nazareth, and great progress had been made in social, religious, and political life. The Crusades greatly affected that illuminated period, known as the Renaissance. Virtues and accomplishments which were lacking at home, were found unexpectedly abroad in the infidel. This led to close examination of the Christian faith, as it was held at that time, and theological discussions between the Christian and the Mohammedan brought the truth home that Catholic dogma was not invulnerable, and Christian Europe had to readjust its views and became more broad-minded and tolerant in the process. It found a moral system independent of Christianity, which it was forced to respect and imitate. It learned in its friendly intercourse with the infidel that it could with great advantage cultivate the romance and imaginative faculties which thrilled through its opponent's faith and it realized, with growing uneasiness and ever-increasing suspicion, that the driving power which had impaled the Crusades was being adroitly directed by the papal powers for purposes of self-advancement. The true and just and serious roused themselves, unable longer to ignore the dangers which had been revealed to them in the searching light of self-examination, which arose in the friction and comparison with foreign races, material and cultural interests were advanced. There was an enormous growth of commerce with the East. Italian merchants established centers everywhere in Syria. The development of the sciences grew, and discoveries and inventions were brought over and introduced from one nation to another. Hospitals and monasteries were erected, leavening their surroundings with their humane influences. Religious orders were established for the protection and care of the pilgrims. Among others, the famous Order of the Templars and the Knights of St. John, or Red Cross Knights, who took the four vows of one, poverty, 2. Chastity 3. Obedience 
4 and perpetual spiritual warfare in the protection and advancement of the Christian faith. These orders were the forerunners of the many different movements which arose in the church at a later period and which in their turn became the forerunners of the Reformation 